Welcome everyone who's joining. Uh, thank you for hopping on today. We're going to allow folks a few more minutes to connect and log on and uh, we'll be getting started right around one o'clock Eastern. Again, welcome to everyone who's joining us. Thank you for logging in. Um, we're gonna wait a couple of more minutes to allow folks to join. Just hang tight, thank you. All right, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. 
we are going to our uh, registration is still ticking up so we're allowing folks a few more minutes to, to sign on thank you for sitting tight we will get started very shortly um, can see some of you are utilizing the chat box so yes get familiar with that and welcome thank you so much for being with us this afternoon All right, um, we are at 105. I'm gonna go ahead and get us started just so we can stay on track. Um, so first off, welcome and thank you for joining us for our first ever RAD awardee virtual training. Um, this training is hosted by the Department of Housing and Urban Development Office of Recapitalization. And over the next few days, uh, we'll be hearing from several experts in the RAD field, um, many internally from HUD and other external experts as well. My name is Grace Campion and I am your host today, along with my colleague at Enterprise here, Christina Payamp smith She will be managing the chat box and questions, um, so please get acquainted with Christina as well. Um, all participants are muted upon entry, so that is, that is how the webinar feature is, gonna, is going to remain today. Uh, if you need any technical assistance at the, throughout today's um, training, please send us a message in the chat box and Christina will do her best to assist you. Uh, as you know, this training will take place over five sessions spread out over the next uh, few, two weeks. Each day we will cover various RAD topics and uh, there will be a couple of panel sessions where we'll have housing authorities that have been through the process, um, share their experience with us. Um, throughout each session, we will also have what we're calling a virtual advice booth. Um, and you can join that at any point during the day to talk to RAD experts about specific questions that you may have. As we are in an online virtual world, we don't have the opportunity to meet in person, but the advice booth is our uh, best attempt at giving you um, some networking opportunities. Uh, now for some of the logistics here. For your best viewing experience, we recommend that you switch your view in the right-hand corner to speaker view. Um, and that way the screen is focused on the presenter who is giving, who's speaking at the time. We have reserved time in each of these presentations for some questions and um, now gonna just share with you the, the ways that you have to express your questions throughout today's training. The first way is to type your question into the chat box and send it to our co-host, Christina Payamp smith uh, She'll be monitoring the chat box and will read all of the questions aloud um, in order received when the presenter is, is ready to take questions. Additionally, if you would like to be unmuted to ask your question um, out loud to the group, please send us a message in the chat box first and ask Christina Payamp smith to unmute your line. And again, she will um, be able to unmute your line and and we'll give you a heads up when your question, when, you're, when we're, at, we're ready for your question. Um, and lastly, the materials uh, for today's session have been posted on the RAD resource desk. Uh, the agenda and the PowerPoint presentations that you will see throughout the training today are all going to be uh, archived and available on the RAD resource desk. You will also find some basic Zoom troubleshooting information and links um, to the advice booth. And last but not least, at the end of today's session, we will be hosting what we're calling coffee breaks, which are uh, opportunities for housing authorities who have signed up in advance um, to ask specific questions and meet with HUD uh, representatives to basically have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, and for those housing authorities, you, uh, we will share the Zoom link at the end of today and uh, you will Go ahead and click on that and go over into the uh, coffee break feature where you'll be greeted by another enterprise staff person, Michaela Miller, and she will match you with your um, 
HUD representative so you can have a chat in what's called a breakout room. Um, our meeting today is being recorded and it will be available on the RAD resource desk as well. Immediately following today's training, you will receive an invitation to complete a survey. Uh, and we ask that you fill this out quickly and let us know your feedback so that we can get a sense of how, how today went. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass, uh, pass the baton over to Tom Davis, uh, Director of the HUD Office of Recapitalization. And he's going to kick us off today with a brief overview of what to expect and um, get us all started. So Tom, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Oh, you're already good. Great. Thank you very much, Grace. Um, and uh, thanks very much to all of you for uh, joining the, the conference. Um, and uh, we, uh, we think the, the technology is going to work, but uh, please give us uh, feedback if, if there are ways that we could make this uh, virtual conference work a little better for you. Um, we're really excited about uh, both the rest of these five days uh, and um, the, this afternoon in particular. Um, this afternoon gives a lot of good uh, foundational information uh, for those of you who have joined, uh, joined the call. Um, and uh, we'll start with uh, Robert Robinson um, walking you through the RAD Resource Desk, which is our web portal um, for a lot of the communication between uh, the Housing Authority participants and uh, the Office of Recapitalization. And after that, we'll have a really great uh, discussion, starting with an overview from, from Jaime Gordnave about uh, the, the choice between PBB and PBRA, uh, and then continuing with a group discussion uh, with panelists from three different housing authorities, and uh, Jaime will do uh, the introductions uh, at that point, um, but panelists from three different housing authorities uh, on their decision making between PBB and PBRA. Uh, which is the uh, ultimate choice of which regulatory platform under Section 8 uh, you want to participate in. Um, and then finally, Greg Byrne of the Office of Recapitalization will um, uh, do a little bit of uh, an overview of how you can get additional help um, from our technical assistance providers. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, you find this afternoon really useful. Uh, I do want to also thank our uh, colleagues at uh, Enterprise who have done a lot of the logistics on uh, making this conference work and are toiling in the background um, to make this uh, run smoothly. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, you get a lot of good information and that you have uh, some opportunities, notwithstanding uh, that we're not able to gather in person, but some opportunities to chat with uh, each other in the advice rooms and chat with uh, various HUD staff in the in the coffee breaks, the one-on-one -on -one coffee breaks at the end of the day. Um, and please give us uh, feedback on how to make the next uh, few days as productive as possible. And of course, always feedback on how we can make the program work better for you in your communities. So thanks very much for joining. Uh, and with that, I will uh, turn the, the program over to Robert. Thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate it. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this sharing of the screen. There we go. So yes, thank you, Tom and, and Grace, and welcome to the first uh, of the sessions. And um, I think fittingly, the, the resource desk is first because it's likely um, the first interaction you as PHAs will be um, interacting with um, the, the RAD team and, and once you get your, your chap and get into the, into the world of, uh, of RAD. So um, this is kind of a good place for, for us to start. The things I'm gonna be covering today uh, will be uh, kind of a, a broad range of, of items from, uh, from registration uh, to the RAD resource desk all the way to finalizing your, your RAD conversion. And one of the things that I'd like to say at the outset is um, please feel free to raise your hand, type in the chat box, um, ask questions whenever you'd like. Uh, Grace and, and Christina are going to 
um, to find a break uh, to interrupt me as I'm going through my presentation so I can mm -hmm. answer questions. A lot of this is going to be demo driven. So when I'm on a particular page of the resource desk, that might spur a question that you have. And so rather than me having to bounce back and forth, um, um, I'm happy to answer questions um, as we go through. So I've got a nice chunk of time here. So I look forward to walking through all of this with you. The main thing for you to remember about the resource desk is when RECAP started the RAD program, they were looking for something that would allow the outside parties to work um, more seamlessly um, with uh, third parties. So working inside the HUD systems is always a challenge, um, but working with the Office of Recapitalization, we helped develop the resource desk so that you as housing authorities and the RECAP staff and others uh, could all collaborate on the RAD conversions. So you'll find the resource desk is going to be your primary point of contact for everything. And all the RAD participants are working through the same documents in the same location. So it's a very nice uh, way for you as a PHA to get um, information about the RAD program, questions about your specific transaction, as well as interact with those who are reviewing um, your transactions as it moves through the RAD conversion. Um, this means that third-party contractors such as um, the CNA contractors or your legal counsel, all of those folks can interact um, with you and with the HUD staff depending on what level of access you want to give uh, your, your team, if you will. Um, it also provides a great administrative record for all the transactions. So everything that's been reviewed by RECAP, everything that you, the PHA, have uploaded, all of the exchanges that you've had through the resource desk are all there for anyone who wants to see it. So uh, in transition from a new executive director at a PHA, for example, it's a nice record for them to see the RAD conversions that have come through, the ones that have left to go, and maybe other ones that might be in the pipeline. Similarly, with the HUD staff, when things move from uh, a RAD conversion into the uh, project-based rental assistance contract, the PBRA contract, under asset management, it allows those account executives to easily access uh, the information that was provided at the time of conversion and see kind of what things were set up for them as they move through. So uh, it's a very nice repository for all of that information. So if you haven't been to the resource desk, kind of here's a, here's a quick screenshot of it, but I'm going to actually go and surf out to the resource desk. So couple of things for you to note. Uh, the resource desk works in all uh, browser platforms. Um, one of the ones that, that works uh, very well for people um, uh, are the iPads and iPhones, which we find fascinating for particularly people that pull the resource desk on, up on their iPhone. I can't do that. It's too sc small of a screen for me, but, but some people do it. Um, but it works in Mozilla and Chrome um, and, uh, and new Microsoft Edge. It doesn't work quite as well in Internet Explorer, um, but that's getting phased out anyway. So hopefully not too many folks use Internet Explorer. The one thing that I would say about Internet Explorer for you users, the uh, downloading of documents is a little bit more challenging. So that's kind of the, the biggest uh, uh, thing there. Otherwise, I think most people typically use Chrome or Mozilla and uh, the, the, the resource desk works very well in those platforms. So just a couple of things of note. I've not logged in yet, but there's lots of information for the general public. So if you haven't decided to move into the, the RAD program yet and don't have a login, um, you can still get lots of information about the resource desk. RAD is broken up into two separate components. We're going to be focusing on the, the RAD for PHA side, but there is also the RAD for multifamily side. So we've set it up so that there are kind of two different portals, if you will. Uh, so for those of us who are working in the RAD for PHA side, we're going to be working on this little spoke section here. So I'm just going to bounce through it real quickly so you can kind of get a sense of what's up there for you. Uh, the first uh, and the top of the waves would be the, the, the RAD notices. So there have been a number of RAD notices. And so how do I keep track of all those? Well, the nice thing we've done for you is we've kind of added a feature on the notices. And then you can get to the most recent notice. And then when you're in the notice and you're browsing around the notice, um, you can get a variety of links. We're in the process of updating this to revision four. We're almost finished with this. But you would see the table of contents presented for you below, and, and then any particular section you wanted to go to, 
the entire section of the notice would be there for you. So it's a nice way to kind of jump around the notice um, and to keep you up to date. Um, so that's a nice, a nice little feature there. Similarly, if I'm going to be applying uh, for RAD, we have a little uh, apply notion here. So this will take you straight over to the RAD application and all of the various instructions that you need on how to apply all of the various worksheets. You'll notice that if you're going to do a portfolio application, that's here. Um, resident information notices are here. So everything that you need to apply for the RAD program shows up right here for you to look at. Continuing along the spoke, the document library. And this is an interesting feature, and we're going to look at this both externally right now, not logged in, and then internally once I log in as a PHA, because the items that you can see change depending on the user type. So, for example, if I open up, uh, let's see, submitting the financing plan. If I open up the submitting the financing plan, I'm going to get some basic information about what's included in the financing plan, um, some stuff about environmental reviews, capital needs assessments, those sorts of things. But once I log in and we're going to come back to this page and I'm a PHA, there are going to be some additional items here that are for people who are actually in the RAD program. So this expands and contracts depending on your uh, uh, affiliation with the RAD program. Just as, as, as you would imagine, there are additional guidance pieces and templates for HUD staff, uh, depending on who's working on that. So it's a, it's a nice way for everybody who's working in RAD to see the things that are relevant uh, to them as a user. Trainings, something that, that, uh, that we're doing now and that we're always doing, there are a whole bunch of trainings that are populated here. Again, all of these trainings are trainings that the public can see, and this, just like the document section, will expand based on the user type. So, for example, you as a PHA have got some specific trainings um, around the CNAs, and you're going to see those when we log in as a PHA. HUD users have a different set of instructions and this, a different set of uh, trainings that they see when they log in uh, to the resource desk. Data, something that people are always interested in. What sort of information do you have on the RAD program? How can I find, about, find out about uh, RAD transactions in my state? Um, that sort of thing. So what we've done here is we've created a couple of different ways that you can get information about the RAD program. This first side here gives you all of the properties that are all in, in the RAD program today. So we have ones that um, have closed, ones that we have applications for, et cetera. And then I can go down to the bottom here and I can actually filter information by state. So if I was interested in looking at transactions um, in Illinois, I could look at all of them. Or if I had a particular PHA in mind, I could click on the PHA. So if I just wanted Chicago Housing Authority transactions, for example, I could do that. Or if I knew where things were, or I was interested to see what the pipeline looked at, I can go over and look at the status. I can see ones that have had chapel awards or transactions that have closed. So you can filter the information based on what you want to see, and it'll export out into an Excel uh, spreadsheet for you. But the other piece that we've added um, probably within the last year are these state fact sheets. Um, and I'm really, um, really like these a lot. Uh, I'm just going to pick a, pick a different state. Let's do Georgia. So if I want to see information about the uh, RAD in the state of Georgia, I click on the name and I hit the create report and I'm going to get a fact sheet. And so this gives just general information about RAD in Georgia. How many housing authorities um, are in the RAD program, how many units are covered, um, what the uh, construction investment is in the state, um, and then the top five housing authorities uh, by closed transactions. So uh, a nice little snippet of information about the RAD program. So if you're new to RAD, you're trying to convince your board to come into RAD, you might want to produce uh, uh, one of these fact sheets for your state to say, look, look at all the PHAs that are doing uh, RAD in our state and look at what they've been able to do. So it's a nice kind of selling document, if you will, as well as informational um, uh, for anything that you might be interested in on the RAD program. And then uh, lastly, we have a search feature. Um, different than the, the, than the notice section, we've created a kind of knowledge base based on a variety of either categories. So I can click these categories um, and I can do a search about anything related to one of these categories. So let's say I'm interested in 
how my rents are getting calculated. So I'm gonna click on the contract rents and here I will see variety of sections where uh, this is referenced throughout the, the RAD resource desk. So you can see the notice section where contract rents are discussed. You can see documents about contract rents, including the rent bundling spreadsheet and threshold reviews uh, for different types of, of blends and, and ways that you might be able to boost your rents, as well as uh, questions that have been asked um, of, the, of the RAD program about contract rents and those various answers. Um, so this is a really valuable uh, search engine, particularly if you're able to drill down and see what you're particularly interested in. As you're navigating the resource desk, you'll notice that we've created kind of these breadcrumbs. So instead of having to go back and forth and bouncing up, I can simply hit where I was most recently and go back to my search page. So if I decided I didn't want to search by category, for example, and I wanted to search by a keyword, I can click on a keyword search, and then I can select one of the kind of pre-selected keywords, most commonly searched for terms, uh, choice mobility, uh, early on was a uh, popular thing to search on. And then I can just click on search. And anything that is on the resource desk about search mobility is gonna pop up here. And then I can search again and do the similar sort of thing. I go back here. I can also ask a question of the resource desk here. So in order to ask a question, since I'm not logged on to the resource desk, I need to provide my contact information. But then as soon as I do that, I send in the question to the resource desk and the resource desk will get back to me um, with an answer. Um, oftentimes, we will try and refer you to more detailed if we're able to figure out the question that you're asking and give you some more detail and other places that you might wanna look to get your answer. Or if it's a simple question, we just give you that simple, that simple answer. Um, so a variety of different ways to bounce around the resource desk, things that you can go see, um, and then getting in touch with us. So that's one of the things that, 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 that I like to show in the beginning. Again, I haven't logged in, so all of this information is available uh, to the public without a user type. However, once you get into RAD and you have your CHAP issued, you will get an email from the resource desk providing you with um, login information uh, for you, particularly your primary point of contact. Um, this is critical because that primary point of contact is the person responsible at the PHA for managing all of the different user types and doing the, the, the uploads um, and the pushing through of the transaction. So I wanna spend some time talking about that um, and showing you because that's one of the things that, that we find, particularly with new PHAs, they struggle a little bit with how they're gonna manage their users. So I'm gonna go ahead and log in as a PHA. Um, uh, those of you who have seen my trainings before or, or participated in the past, you know that, uh, that I use uh, uh, Meredith Day from the um, Durham Housing Authority. She's always been nice enough to let me use her as a uh, as a test uh, case. So I use her her login information. So um, so we're actually seeing a real live PHA on the resource desk. So all users that log in the resource desk have a series of cards that come up, and depending on what your capacity is um, as a participant on the resource desk, you're going to get different different cards. Um, most everyone has a notifications card here. Um, and most everyone has some sort of link to the chaps that are in their uh, portfolio. So in this case, um, if I expand this, I see all of the transactions that are uh, either in or have been in uh, the, the Durham portfolio that Meredith is moving through. I can also quickly go to close transactions and see all of the transactions um, that Durham has closed. If I wanna jump to one of these and see more information, all I have to do is click on the name of the property and that will take me through uh, to the actual transaction itself. And we're gonna take a look at that a little bit more closely in a minute. But as I'm looking at these various cards, I also see that I've got a user administration card here. So this user administration card is only gonna be available to the uh, point of contact or someone who that point of contact has given user administration rights to. And so when I take a look at this card more closely, I'm gonna see a number of things. So first, I as a, uh, a point of contact or a primary user, I can create a new user. So I can go into the resource desk and I can click on this and I can fill out the information for a new user that will have access to uh, the Durham, North Carolina uh, uh, resource desk. So that's pretty straightforward, that's great. But what if I don't 
want to do that if I want to only provide uh, access to someone who asks for it. So how does that happen? Well, right below that, you see that we have new requests. So there are a couple of folks here who have asked for access uh, to the Durham portfolio um, that have not been reviewed and approved yet. So if I wanted to take a look at Matt, for example, I click here and I see um, that he has requested access and I can make him active and approved. So I'm able to do that um, from my user login. Once I do that, I'm then able to see all of the uh, users or uh, folks that have asked for access um, to our account. And so in this case, you'll see there are a couple of um, inactive accounts, um, a couple of active accounts, um, and all variety of folks. So we have Meredith is listed as the PHA primary, as I said, and then I can designate folks as consultants um, and give them access and kind of see where they, where they play out. Um, depending on what I want to let them have access to. So let's take a look and see here. Let's pull up um, Barbara. I can then give each user different types of permissions. So each PHA controls what the users see or can do on the resource desk. So if I wanted to change this so that Barbara was only able to see things, then I would simply uncheck all of these various boxes and she wouldn't be able to do the various functions um, that she was doing before. So in this particular case, you know, Barbara is able to uh, also edit users, um, she can assign properties, and she can also upload documents and write to the PHA pages, which means that she can pretty much function um, in all capacities on the resource desk. This is something that a lot of PHAs really like because they have some consultants that they don't want to do anything, but they want them to be able to see information on the resource desk and kind of help them move through by seeing what, what people have done. It's also helpful if you have a consultant that's helping you move through the, the RAD process and you want them to be able to upload documents. Um, so it's something that, that you as a PHA control. The resource desk administration folks, my, my team, we try hard not to get into the mix here. We try hard to um, only uh, have the PHAs monitoring and, and, and approving their various user groups. Um, we feel like that's their responsibility. Certainly if you're struggling and you have um, issues that you're, that you're, that you're having in uh, approving somebody, you can always click on the contact RAD button right here. And you notice the difference from when I, log when I hit that button on the main page without logging in, it was asking for my uh, name and email address. In this particular case, since we know it's Meredith, we don't need any, that information. I can simply type in the request that I have um, of the resource desk and submit the question and someone will get back to, back to her um, promptly. So that's a nice, a nice feature um, that we have there. All right, so kind of wrapping up this main login page, um, we also have uh, for PHAs uh, a little item in this kind of mid menu, if you will, um, called action items. And when I click on this, I can see that there are two choices for me. I can do a new application or I can request technical assistance. Uh, I know Greg's gonna be talking more specifically about uh, technical assistance uh, later today, but I did wanna to touch on this real quickly because this is a new feature um, that we added back in September um, that, uh, that some PHAs have been taking advantage of. And it is a kind of portfolio wide. You notice I don't have to have selected a, a transaction. I'm just kind of generally in my PHA uh, portfolio. I'm not looking at a specific transaction, but I want to request some technical assistance. So when I click on this technical assistance box, I'm going to be given a couple of choices on what I need. So if I have some pro property specific information, I'm going to select that and then type in the note what I want to, to, to get assistance with. Or if I just want general information about my portfolio or kind of some uh, red administrative assistance, that sort of thing. Lots of different choices here. Um, we're really trying hard to have the PHAs coming through the RAD program be as self-sufficient as possible um, to be able to find answers to questions through the document library, et cetera, um, but to be able to reach out when they need help and make it easy for them. So in this case, we can simply type in information here, submit the request, and then the resource desk will get back to you directly. 
You maybe get be given a broader level of technical assistance, which is what Greg's going to talk about, or you may just get an email or a phone call directly from the resource desk answering your specific question and hopefully move you along um, through the RAD program. Okay, so now that we've kind of bounced through that main section, I want to take a look at project specific information. So I'm ready to start taking a look at one of my transactions. You'll notice that we have a RAD status um, out here. So you can quickly see where transactions are um, in your portfolio. In this case, they have a number of transactions um, where they're waiting to submit their financing plan. Um, they've also withdrawn a few transactions, but there aren't any that are in with, with recap um, uh, review right now. So if they were, it would say financing plan submitted, or if the financing plan had been submitted and approved and an RCC was issued, it would say RCC issued. Again, if I wanted to see closed transactions, we have a separate card for that. So we don't want to commingle these two. This first card is kind of active transactions, whereas the second card uh, is really talking about closed transactions. So back to my active transactions, let's take a look at this 300 East Main transaction. So the resource desk knows generally where you are in the process. And so it takes you to the working page um, for that particular transaction and, it, and its status. So you'll notice that now we've expanded this mid menu to cover a lot of different things. And so I'm going to take a look at a couple of these to show you kind of the most critical items of each one. So the way we've set this up is these transaction pages are really what we call your working pages. So right now, there's been no concept call requested and no financing plan submitted yet. So the resource desk automatically takes a transaction to the concept call checklist. That's the page we're on here. And you'll notice on the breadcrumbs, that name is the same here. So I'm on the concept call checklist. If I wanted to, if I happened to go someplace else and I wanted to go back to the concept call checklist, I would simply go to the transaction pages and click on the concept call checklist. Okay, this is gonna be important in a second when I talk about the financing plan submissions. But again, this is a, a new transaction, it's just came in. So we're being taken by the resource desk to the most logical place to do the work that I need to do, which is the concept call checklist. This is then set up with a couple of different cards. And so if I wanna navigate through the cards on any given page, so I'm on the concept call checklist page, I can then go to this go to menu here and I can jump between the two cards that are available to me on this page. And again, we're gonna look at some other pages and you're gonna have more cards. But the nice thing about this is, you'll notice that as I scroll down, there's lots of scrolling going on. And rather than having to scroll up and down to the top and the bottom, if I was all the way at the bottom of this page and I actually wanted to go back to the top and just to the, to the major property card, I can simply go to the go to button, select property, and it's gonna take me back to the top without me having to scroll up and down. Um, this becomes very useful later on when I'm uploading documents and I'm looking at different cards. Uh, I, I want to be able to bounce around here. So the two cards that we have available on the concept call are just a general property information card. And this card we tried to make be consistent throughout the, the resource test. So as you bounce through the various working pages, these transaction pages, you're going to get a property summary at the top of all of them. So it's going to start with the housing authority name, the property name that you're, that you're working on, um, general information, where it is in the process, financing plans not submitted yet, and then the most critical date um, that's associated with where you are in the process. So as I mentioned, no financing plan submitted yet, so the critical date for this is when the financing plan is due. So as this date approaches, you know you need to be getting the information in and, and submitting the financing plan. Um, you're going to see that very quickly here. If this said RCC issued for the RAD status, then this would change to the closing date because that's the date that you're, that you're moving towards, okay? So it's a nice place to see kind of where things are and what your next due dates are. And then as I scroll through, this is the concept call page. So it's, we're getting, getting ready to generate the, the request for a concept call, which is this being able to hit this button here. But I have a number of deficiencies before I can do that the resource desk tells you what those deficiencies are. So in this case, there are a number of things that need to be done in this transaction before you'll be willing to be able to schedule the, the concept call. This theme runs through 
all of the working pages of the resource desk. We've tried very hard to give you uh, immediate tips on things that you need to accomplish reviews that need to be done, those sorts of things, so that you're not hunting and pecking and running back and forth and looking at the notice and trying to keep track of all this stuff. We're trying to make the, the resource desk as smart as possible um, so that you don't have to do a lot of hunting and pecking for things. Similarly, general information about your transaction. So is it new construction or is it rehab? Is there gonna be a first mortgage? Is it gonna be a an FHA insured mortgage? Are you gonna be using tax credits? So these the answers to these questions are very important for what documents are required for the resource desk and the financing plan submission, as well as in a second, we're gonna take a look at the concept call checklist, as well as some of the answers to the concept call questions and additional um, approvals that you're gonna need. So very important that you get these right. Question, how do I fix this? What's going on here? Okay, what if this was new construction? and I had not checked that box? Or what if I wasn't using track tax credits and I needed to change that? Interesting, there are a couple of different places to change that. The easiest one is on the PHA summary page. So if I click on the PHA summary page, it's gonna take me to a page with all of the active transactions listed out with the critical information about those transactions listed here. So we've been working on this 300 East Main transaction so if it was new construction instead of rehab, I would change that box. If it was uh, not a tax credit transaction, I would change that to none. In this case, they'd selected both. So they're looking at doing both fours and nines in this particular transaction. Again, if it's not a, I'm going to show you this as well. This is another nice feature. So if I change this to none, ah, I've created a problem. There's a big red, red boxes around a couple of choices here. Why did that happen? Well, because tax credit transactions utilize a different financing plan grid. So if I change the answer here that this is not gonna be a tax credit transaction, I need to remember to change the financing plan grid to either an FHA transaction or a no debt or conventional debt transaction. So if I were to change that and then save it, that flag would go away and we would be back to, back to normal again. Then if I changed it back to tax credit transactions and I forgot to change the financing plan grid, I would simply go back here and change it back to there. Okay, so that's something that's very helpful for everybody is to make sure that all of the various pieces because the documents that are being uploaded in the financing plan are driven by what sorts of financing um, you are doing as a PHA. So this is the place where you're going to kind of make those selections on a, on a property by property basis. So that's a place where you would go and change these. So now going back to the property again to see we're back on the tax credit grid. We're back to where we're using tax credits. So then the bottom section here, um, this is the concept call checklist. Again, this is something new that we introduced um, back in September. It's been very successful to uh, allow PHAs to uh, really think through uh, their transactions to provide recap with the information that they need to review their transactions uh, more quickly, um, gets more uh, uh, consistent financing plan submissions. So these bank of questions kind of go through and, and answer each one um, will then drive potentially other requirements. So uh, continuing the theme of new construction, let's just decide that in fact, this is a new construction transaction. So I'm gonna change this to new construction and I'm gonna update the checklist. And so a couple of things just happened. So one thing you'll note, that box got checked. So since the question is asked in the concept call checklist, we don't make you bounce back and forth to that PHA summary page and check boxes. We try and tie the answers uh, to the various check boxes that were required. If I had changed, it, changed the, uh, the check box here on new construction, this answer would have been populated for me here. So the various places roll through to each other, but you don't have to kind of remember to go back and check bo other boxes and that sort of thing. Um, so hopefully that makes it easier for you. But more importantly, Robert? you'll notice that we have a red guide that just kind of red warning uh, language that's come up saying that you cannot submit your financing plan until the site neighborhoods, the SNS review has been completed and approved, okay? So 
This lets you know that you have an FHEO document that needs to be not only uploaded, but it has to be approved before you're going to be able to submit your financing plan. Okay, and we're going to take, I'm going to leave this flag there because we're going to take a look at that in just a minute so you can kind of see how um, that rolls through. But similarly, there are all sorts of different questions um, in the checklist that then provide those same sorts of back and forth um, uh, that for, for you and trying to make things easier for you to, to get a, a successful transaction. So let's Robert, this over. is Grace. Sure. Hey, Grace. I'm just going to jump in. Hey there. Yeah. Uh, this is really great. I just wanted to give you a five minute warning and let you know on, on time. And we do have a couple of questions. So perfect. Um, we can either do those now or after you're after you wrapped up. So let me finish this thought and then I want to go to the question. So I want to just kind of finish this perfect. link back and then I'll be, mm -hmm. um, be ready to take a question because I think this Wonderful. wraps up a couple of different things that I wanted to talk about. So thank you for that. So, um, so now I've, I've answered that question. And so now to submit my financing plan information, I'm going to go to the financing plan working page. And again, as I mentioned, here's my kind of general, uh, general page. Um, then I've got a new card uh, that I need to fill out on ownership information. But then as I scroll down, this is the most important card um, during this time because these are the places, this is the place that I'm lo loading up the documents for my financing plan. And so as I scroll down, uh, I'm going to see that I need to upload my new construction FHEO site neighborhoods review. That's what that is. So I'm going to choose a file, add that file. And when that file gets added here, it's going to roll through to the FHEO page. And this is where the HUD FHEO staff will get a notification that there's a document loaded there and that they need to do a review. You'll notice that that NA box is not checked because that means that the site neighborhoods is required. You will have uploaded a document here. The FHEO staff will have assigned somebody to do a review. They'll go through their review. They'll either uh, approve it or reject it upload documentation around either one. You as the PHA will get notified from the resource desk of the outcome. Hopefully it's been approved and then you can move forward. Um, you'll notice that uh, in, in, in a lot of these cases, uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, an NA checkbox. If I change that somewhere else on the concept call checklist, that box will be unchecked. Um, so that's how that ties through for you and it allows you to interact with the necessary HUD reviewer who's doing the approvals for you. So just wanted to make that link. So Grace, go ahead. Give me, give me, hit me with the questions. Okay, wonderful. Um, Christina has got three questions here so far. Excellent. So I'm going to have her read those out. All right. Great. Uh, Christina, go for it. Great. Uh, so the first question is, is there a way to assign specific projects to a user without giving access to the full portfolio? So we're working on that. There, 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 is, there is a way. So if you have that, that, is that situation, shoot us, shoot the, hit, a, hit a contact red button, shoot us a note, and we're happy to work with you um, on making, making that available. We're trying to get that rolled out. It's taking a little bit more time than we had hoped. It's a little bit more challenging, um, but we are working with that, and we would love to work with a PHA who, who wants to do that so that we have a, a, a test bed to do that through. That's a great question, and we, and we, we want to be able to do that. Um, it's just taking us some time, so shoot us a note. Great. Thank you. The next question is, do any PHAs allow future RAD owners access to the RAD resource desk during the pre-closing phase? Sure. So oftentimes a PHA will allow their developer to, um, to work with them directly through the resource desk um, on the transaction that, that, that they're teaming with the PHA on. So yes, that happens all the time. And there are a number of PHAs that have a single development group that's helping them do their entire portfolio. And so they work through that with them and they've given the user rights uh, necessary to allow them to upload documents and do the various contacts and things. So yes, that happens quite often. Great. Next question is, if you accidentally attach, upload an incorrect support document, is there a way to delete the attachment? 
Yeah, so recap does not allow for deletions. Um, whenever it's loaded to the resource desk, um, we want to keep it there. We want to keep that administrative record. We don't want to get into a situation where um, a PHA says, but I uploaded that and, and somebody forgot to tell us to, 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 to not delete it, that sort of thing. So what we do sometimes do, however, is if uh, a PHA uploads something in the wrong section, so for example, let's say somebody uploaded the conversion overview down here in the, in the resident comments, if you suit the resource desk and we're happy to move that up into the proper spot. But if you uploaded a conversion overview, for example, and you said, oh no, that's actually not the conversion overview for this transaction, then just go in, upload the conversion overview, overview for this transaction, and it'll show up um, as the last one uploaded. And so oftentimes you'll see in this PHA comment section, you'll see the PHA note, please use the most recent version, you know, as the previous version is no longer, uh, no longer relevant. So great question. And I think we have one last one in the queue. So all documents that appear uh, there must be uploaded. That's correct. So documents that are going to appear here are going to be uploaded. So the PHA uploads these. They make comments here. And you'll notice out to the right, we've got transaction manager comments. So once this transaction has the financing plan submitted and the transaction manager is doing their review, they'll make comments potentially back, back and forth with you they can't upload documents. So let's say, for example, you uploaded uh, a CNA um, and the uh, transaction manager did a review and wanted some modifications made to that. They can't make modifications. They can't upload a new document that they'll simply state in their comments, you know, please make the comments, the, 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 the edits that we suggested and upload a new version. You would then do that um, and the TM can then look at that. So that's how that works. And it's also just to jump real quick, because I know I'm running out of time, but it's also uh, the same sort of thing happens on the closing page, where the closing documents are uploaded by the PHA, um, and they're reviewed by the RAD closing coordinator. It also happens on the final closing document section, where the final uh, closing docs are uploaded by the PHA, okay? Um, and then once you close a transaction, I'm gonna jump real quick. So you can see this. So once you close a transaction, kind of leaving RAD, and once you're done, you then are able to um, do your completion certification. So you'll notice that we're now on the rehab, no construction completion cert. They have to do their completion certification. They go through, populate all these questions, and move it forward. And that's kind of the, the end of RAD at that point. OK? Christina, other questions? Um, this is Grace here. We have hey, two others, but I know we're tight on time. Um, so I will, Robert, share those with you directly and okay. uh, we can answer through the Q&A here. Crappy. Uh, Happy do you do have that. any no final thoughts? Let me um, jump back over to my, my slideshow real quick and just, mm -hmm. um, so any problems anybody comes up with, any uh, specific information, you can hit the RAD, uh, contact RAD button, or you can send me an email or give me a phone call directly, and I'm more than happy to, uh, to get back in touch with you. So thanks for, for your time and um, look forward to, to hearing from you and working with you moving forward. Thank you, Robert. Um, thanks, Grace. Wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and do a screen share here. We are at um, our 10-minute break, so we want to give everyone a chance to stretch. Um, please leave your computers on um, and come back at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we will be digging into a, a discussion with Jaime about project-based vouchers versus PBRA and then uh, into our moderated panel discussion. So take some time um, and join us back at 2. Thank you.
All right, team, just giving everyone a two minute warning. Um, Jaime's getting set up, so please make your way back to your computers and we'll get started um, right at the top of the hour. Okay, so welcome back everyone. We are about to get started with the second half of our, um, of our day. We've got a presentation here for the next 30 minutes with Jaime, and then we'll be moving into a panel discussion with uh, three members of housing authorities from across the country. And then we'll be wrapping up with um, Greg Byrne of the Office of Recapitalization, giving us um, some more details about technical assistance. So, um, Jaime, I know you've got a couple of poll questions you'd like to start off with. So I'm going to kick it over to you and then let me know when you're ready to, to initiate the polls and um, folks will, that'll pop up on your screen shortly. Jaime, take it away. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. And it's a morning still for some of you. So good morning and good afternoon. My topic is not nearly as complicated as the one Robert had to present, but uh, it's, it's equally interesting, let's put it that way. So project-based vouchers or project-based rental assistance, as Robert was showing you the financing plan page, it's number two on that list, and it's a simple tick box. Which one are you choosing? And that's what we're going to talk about here today. But before we do that, I want to learn a little bit more about who my audience is here, who's on the uh, video with us and or audio. And then I have a couple questions to gauge how much you already know about the topic. So I'll pass it back to you, uh, Grace, to um, Wonderful. take us through the poll. OK, great. So. Um... For all of our participants, uh, we've got a, we have seven questions. Jaime would like to get to know you a little bit more. Um, so on your screen in a, in, a, in a couple of seconds, you'll see a poll um, pop up. It's not a pop-up ad. Please click on it and answer, and it will you know, bring you through the seven questions. Uh, after everyone has finished answering, we're gonna share the results out and um, chat a bit. And these are easy questions, not, not, not a quiz. So here we go. All right, great job, guys. We've got about 50 out of the 300 of you responding, so keep it going.
Actually, a couple of them are quiz questions. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> now that I look at these a little more closely. Awesome. Yeah, keep it going. About half, half, half of you have responded. So I'll keep it open another minute here. So will you read out the answers or are we going to see them on screen? You're going to see the responses on screen. Yeah. So. Very nice. Yeah. Okay, it seems like our responses are starting to slow down. Um, let's give it 30 seconds, see if we can hit 200, and then I may you'll get all of this great new information um, to inform your presentation and our discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right, um, gonna end polling in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, we're going to close the poll. <laughs> and here we go. Going to show you guys should all be able to see on your screen in a pop up um, the poll results. And for those who are audio only, right. So, which option did you take on your RAD application? 62% RAD PBV. Does your housing authority have its own voucher program? 85% yes, 15% no. Are you a large, medium, or small PHA? And 52% are large, 31% are medium, and 17% are small. So do RAD PBV and RAD PBRA always have the same contract rent levels, 17% say no, and 83% have the correct answer. <laughs> By when must the PHA finalize its decision to select either RAD PBV or RAD PBRA? 25% say 180 days from CHAP issuance. 12% say before the concept call. 39% say before submission of financing plan and 23% say at time of accepting the RAD conversion commitment. I'm not exactly sure what, what the right answer is on this one. So maybe somebody else will, will in, inform us. Obviously, the, um, a lot, as we'll see in our discussion, your selection determines many of the documents that need to be submitted for the financing plan, and they do differ between RAD PBV and RAD PBRA. So uh, you definitely would need to have a pretty firm selection before you submit your financing plan. Uh, at that point, you're pretty well locked in. So at least the 23% that said you could wait until the RAD conversion commitment, it may be technically possible to make a change after you submit your financing plan, but you'd have a lot of catch up work to do and uh, with your, especially if you've got any financing or uh, investment coming into your project. Number six, if a PHA is converting multiple amps, does the PHA need to keep all amps as either PBRA or PBV, but not mix them? And 24% say yes, and 76% say no, which is the correct answer. Number seven, last one, the PHA that selects RAD 
PPV is able to continue directly owning and managing its properties. 69% say true and 31% say false. The actual correct answer is, is false. So it's good that we have you all here. You'll, you'll find out why, why that's false. All right, so I'm going to close that out. Excellent, thank you all. And um, Jaime, you're ready to go. I'm going to mute I myself. And, uh, Jaime has asked that we hold questions until the end. So for those of you who have them, please um, let us know in the chat box and we will keep tabs on those and then we'll, we'll let Jaime know how many he's got to answer. Okay, thank go. you. So on this first slide, I try to hit the main points of both RAD PBV and RAD PBRA, uh, although there are many, many, many other nuances to the difference between the two. So RAD PBV, this is selecting that you will use project-based vouchers. And those vouchers come with a housing assistance payment contract that's administered by the PHA and as a, the administrator of that HAP contract and those vouchers, the PHA receives an admin fee um, in the same manner that you receive an admin fee for your housing choice vouchers uh, in that program. So the, the vouchers you receive um, get integrated into your housing choice voucher program and by and large uh, follow rules of of that, uh, that program. The contract rent, and that this speaks a little bit to one of the questions, if the rents are the same in PBV and PBRA, in many cases, even in most cases, they end up being the same, but they're not always the same. So the, there's a cap in each RAD PBV and RAD PBRA, and the, the rents are capped at the lowest of three things under PBV. So you either get your current funding, and that's on the list of all the contract rents. That's where you find what your current funding is, although it's, it's 2018 contract rents, and so you have to add the uh, operating cost adjustment factors for 2019 and 2020. And that tells you what your current funding is. So it's either that number or 110% of the fair market rent minus the utility allowance or the rent reasonableness number. So it's the lowest of those three things. And if you look over at RAD PBRA, you see the, the capping is the lower of two things, either the current funding or 120% of fair market rents minus the utility allowances. And there are exceptions on the PBRA side that under certain circumstances, when supported with a rent comparability study, your PBRA rents can actually go as, as high as 150% of the fair market rents minus the U, utility allowances. So the, the, whereas the RAD PBV is administered by the authority, the HAP contract for RAD PBRA is administered directly by HUD's Office of Housing. And since they're administering it either directly or through the uh, performance-based contract administrators that, that they work with in many cases, the uh, fee is then not shared with the authority because the authority's not doing the work of administering the, the vouchers. Typically, uh, PBRA is, is structured more on a project-based uh, basis in that the, the owner manages the waiting list. It is possible under RAD PBV to also have a site-based waiting list, um, but there's a process to go through for, for doing that. So who's, who's winning? So we took a poll and the majority of you were, uh, were had indicated RAD PBV, and, and so looks like you're on, on the winning side there. 
you see in terms of total units, and this, these numbers are from January, but uh, RAD PBB was 72,000 of the units of the 130 or so a thousand that were closed at that time. And RAD PBRA is only 57,000. But it is interesting to see that in the small PHAs, they split just about 50-50. So the small PHAs, 250 or fewer units, have the higher percentage of uh, RAD PBRA than either the, the medium-sized authorities or especially the, the large PHAs. And we're gonna have in our panel both uh, medium and large PHAs. So maybe we'll find out uh, why there's, they're going in that direction. So what are the main reasons that I have heard in, in the eight years that I've been working with the RAD program? What are the major reasons for selecting PBV? And all of these you, you can see were in those initial, uh, in the initial slide. The admin fees are a big driver. A lot of authorities look at that and say, well, we, we have a program we wanna grow the program and feed the program and, and we want that revenue. Secondly, because the PBV is operated like the Housing Choice Voucher Program integrated with it, the authorities feel that they have more control over the relationship with the tenants and the control and operation of the program. Some PHAs, have had less than ideal experiences with HUD's multifamily program, or, or they've just heard things and uh, don't like what they've heard about how those programs work. So it's a choice, uh, a relationship choice. And of course that, that uh, can vary geographically as well. So depending on the size of an existing housing choice voucher program, sometimes it's attractive to say, well, if we, if we're converting our public housing to section eight and we bring those vouchers into our, our operations on that part of our organization, that will provide uh, more efficiencies. And because they're growing that side of their operation, that may be a way of, of uh, keeping uh, more jobs within the organization. So what are the main reasons offered for why authorities choose PBRA, project-based rental assistance? As we saw on the first slide, sometimes if there's a higher rent, it's always the PBRA rent that's higher than the RAD PBV. So the rent cap is a determining factor in, I would say maybe 10 or 15% of the uh, authorities in, in the country just depends on on what the uh, fair market rents are and how they compare to the, the RAD rents. Now, if an authority doesn't have a voucher program, they either have to get another authority to um, serve as their contract administrator, uh, or they have to go with PBRA. So that's one of the drivers. And it, it is the case that an, a, a larger percentage of small PHAs uh, don't have a, their, their own voucher program than with the larger PHAs. Uh, a number of, of authorities um, through their other, other operations, other parts of their organization are already familiar with, or maybe you're already managing the uh, project with project-based rental assistance. As I said before, it, it uh, is seen by many as, as working better with, with a strictly site-based management, especially if there's a third party uh, manager, which is sometimes part of a, a mixed finance or existing mixed finance or, or projects that are using tax credits. The PBRA program has been around longer. It's been around since 1974 and it has far more units um, than, than the PBV program, which didn't come around until the late uh, 
the 1990s. Another reason, and, and I think uh, at least one of our three panelists has this situation where they have a project in an opportunity zone and there can be a boost of the RAD contract rent under certain circumstances of up to $100 per unit month for projects in the opportunity zone. That's a new priority of HUD and it only uh, materialized in uh, revision four of the RAD notice. So what's impacted by the selection your agency makes between PBB and PBRA? And, and I say everything, exclamation mark. This is the highlights of the things that are impacted. So rent setting, which we already talked about, which is the funding level. And that's particularly important to sometimes to make deals work. So I know in my own consulting work with authorities and our own development work, that's one of the earliest things we look at is what are the rents gonna be under RAD PBB and RAD PBRA. It can impact staffing. Um, because there's different reporting systems, there's different software systems to support uh, the, the uh, tracking of, um, of the certifications and recertifications and uploading them to, to the respective databases where they need to be submitted. Regulations are different for the two programs. Financing plan requirements differ. And for, for most of these things on this list here, we're gonna, we're gonna spell them out in a little more detail. So I won't go into a lot of detail here. The closing documents are different. Leases are different. How they handle the uh, operating cost adjustment factor, the OCAF, that's the cost of living adjustment to the contract rents. And there's different ways that they're capped in the, in the two programs. The inspections after you close, the inspections are handled differently. And of course the HAP contract administration is different. Environmental reporting requirements are different. For RAD PBV, those are frequently uh, part 58 environmental reporting and for PBRA, uh, it's typically part 50. So the different, different requirements there. How each program handles choice mobility, um, that's different. And then the ownership uh, direct ownership, what, how the authority can maintain direct ownership has to be handled differently under PBV than under uh, PBRA. It can be handled the, the same, but in many cases, the authority wants to be both in the ownership and the management role. And they, for PBV, there has to be a, a kind of a, a, a different structure. And there's a Thursday session that Kathleen Foster is doing about how to set up these structures. So I'll put in a plug for Kathleen session. And then the accounting and reporting are, are, are handled differently. Also, in, in some cases, the lender and investor uh, may have preferences between the programs and, and that may impact decisions that you make. Rent setting and funding. So as I said, PBRA, if, if you, one of the two is higher, it's gonna be the RAD PBRA. And also, if, you're in an, if your project's in an opportunity zone and you are doing a, either new construction or an extensive rehab that reaches a certain level of, of uh, uh, hard construction costs, then you need to be using the PBRA program to take advantage of that boost. So I pulled, pulled a real life example here that's, that's quite interesting. You see the RAD contract rents on, on the left column, 2020 RAD contract rents. The PBV uh, rents turn out to be, uh, they're not, they're not uh, capped by either the 110%, that doesn't cap it, nor does the uh, rent reasonable. So they end up being exactly the same as the 2020 RAD rents. And the PBRA would be the same, except that uh, this particular project is in an opportunity zone. So they're getting a $100 boost. Then, 
um, the, in the far right column are the Section 18 tenant protection vouchers, so their rents being operated as project-based vouchers. That's the only way you can operate uh, tenant protection vouchers. And so in the column before that, I picked which one is better for each bedroom size. So in this particular case, the uh, efficiencies in one bedrooms do better with the, the uh, RAD rents, RAD PBRA rents, and the two bedroom and three bedrooms do better with the section 18 rent. So I'm showing those bedroom sizes coming in with that rent and the first two coming in with, with the other rent. And that adds a, you know, blended uh, uh, average per unit month adds another $2. And anybody who does development knows every $2 helps. So under financing plan requirements, um, here are some of those. The PBRA requires that um, every party in the development other than the housing authority has to have a 2530 clearance. Um, and by and large, those are submitted in a separate system called APPS. Part 50 environmental report with a phase one uh, is required for PBRA and a part 58 for PBV. PBRA requires an affirmative fair marketing, fair housing marketing plan. Only under PBRA can there be a good cause exemption for choice mobility. Choice mobility, um, all PBV projects need to uh, offer choice mobility if a project doesn't have, if an authority doesn't have its own uh, voucher program and they're going PBRA, they may be eligible for an exemption. There's a limited number of exemptions available. I don't believe HUD has reached that cap yet. The when choice mobility kicks in is after two years for a PBRA and it's after one year for a PBV. So you see my theme up early on is almost every aspect of your program is uh, impacted by, by this choice. And yet it was just a simple yes, no toggle. And there are some nuanced differences on how site and neighborhood standards are uh, regulated. Okay, so this is a, a, a point that uh, was one of the, it was a trick question. Greg Byrne said I shouldn't ask trick questions, but I had to have at least one in there. So if a PHA has ownership, it needs to have an independent agency uh, a partnership with an independent agency for doing the housing quality standards inspections, the rent reasonableness determination, and uh, implementing or determining the operating cost adjustment uh, on an annual basis. The PHA cannot contract with itself on the HAP. So it cannot be both the administrator of the HAP and the direct owner of the, of the property. Now there's a solution for that and we'll, we'll talk about that on the next slide. And also under HAP contract administration in, in the first year, there is no admin fee that the authority can earn in that first year. Under PBRA, the PHA, since it's, it's only signing one half of the HAP agreement, HUD is signing the other, it can, easily have direct ownership. And the, the HAP contract under PBRA, there's two flavors of the HAP contract PBRA. Old regulation has no restriction on, on cash flow, and that's the kind of HAP, HAP agreement that PBRA program has. There's a great- hey, hi, um, This is great. Yes. I just Two wanted to jump morning. in and give us a little uh, time check, um, knowing that our panelists are ready to go. So, two, two, yeah, two minute two warning. Minutes. Gotcha. So, Accounting Brief 22 is the, the least read the document, but it, I highly recommend it. And it directly addresses um, the, the system or the method that you can engage to 
bring another entity into the picture. So the, the authority can set up an affiliate or a nonprofit subsidiary that is the owner of the project. And so that's the authority on one side and that other legal entity uh, on the other side of the HAP agreement. And that's an acceptable solution. Uh, different accounting and reporting. I won't go into great details here, but the certifications and research are 50058s on the PBV side and they're 59s on the PBRA. And they get filed into different tracking systems and you need different software. Uh, so if you're doing both PBV and PBRA, you're, you're operating two different systems. So this is the first slide I had that showed all the things that are impacted and I'm just recapping them here. And when you download your, your slides, you can get the links here to these various documents that quick guide to PBRA, quick guide to PBV. And there's, there's a, a guide to choosing between RAD PBV and RAD PBRA. A few more guides. Uh, the HOTMA legislation, very important, that, that controls uh, the implementation of project-based vouchers. I didn't ask if there's any moving to work authorities, but they have some ad additional guidance as well because they have uh, fungibility between their, their programs. And the topics that are, this is the cover of the, the HUD guide that's available where Robert showed us how to, how to get into the documents. Um, and the, that's the table of contents. So with that, I think I'm close to on time. Am I not, Grace? Yes, wonderful. I'm within a minute here. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna, you can go ahead and introduce our panelists. I'm gonna just on the back end here, ask them to join us by video and we'll get our three panelists up and running. Go ahead and introduce and them. Do I need to stop sharing or? You can keep your screen up. Um, looks like Anthony is, has jumped on, Joe. Go ahead and unmute you and Christina. Okay, so right. I'm gonna, see everybody here. Uh, Christina, as you can see, is with the Fresno Housing Authority and of the three panelists, they have more RAD, RAD transactions under their belt uh, than anybody and they've been anybody on the panel and they've been involved in RAD since 2013. So, they have uh, many, many years of experience with the program. Uh, Anthony is the executive director of the Little Rock Housing Authority, also known as the Metropolitan Housing Alliance. They did a rebranding about five or six years ago. And, and Joe is with the bust and, and uh, they, have, they have done uh, 10, they've had 10 chaps um, and closed six of them. And they've been, their earliest chaps were in 2015. Boston, Joe is, is with the, the Boston Housing Authority and they have uh, 11 chaps and they've closed two of them, one in 2017 and one in, in, in 2018. So uh, if, if, are you gonna bring them um, up on visual screen here? How does that work? Yes, our, all, all three of our panelists have their video enabled. So um, participants should be able to see Anthony, Christina and Joe, as well as Jaime. And um, so we'll let you guys uh, chat and have, have a, a robust discussion about your choice um, when you did your RAD transactions. Very, very good. <clears throat> so Christina, can I, and I turn to you first. It's interesting to note that you have closed both PBRA and PBV projects. <clears throat> um, and now you were, you were moving toward mostly PBV. So having, having watched uh, the, the brief presentation, what are your thoughts and why are you changing horses here kind of midstream? Yeah, so... Um... 
we've been, like you said, we've been doing RAD since the beginning. Our first project was in 2013. We are a large housing authority. And so we do administer about 13,000 housing choice vouchers. And we started out with about 2,000 units of public housing in the beginning. And so the first 10 transactions that we did, we've done, we're on our 13th now. The first 10, we did choose PBRA. And, and, and kind of the impetus behind PBRA in the beginning uh, was we did like that, uh, we were a little concerned that the tenants uh, could move in 12 months with the choice mobility option under PBV. So we wanted that sense of security that we had that extra 12 months under PBRA. And then we thought at the beginning that that funding stream was a little more consistent to coming from uh, the Office of Multifamily, that it might be a little more consistent than the PBV funding. Um, and operationally, our property management staff, because we do self-manage our properties, uh, they're a little more comfortable with PBRA because they have whole control over the certifications and the timing of filling vacancies. Uh, whereas um, in PBV, we have another department, our HCV division, that handles those recertifications. And so they feel like they have to wait on another department before they can get the files back. You know, and so they like having that control, even though it's a little more work for them. Um, and then also um, the vacancy payments was a factor in that we could get uh, subsidy payments for up to 60 days on a vacancy with the PBRA. So that's how we got started. And then just recently, within the past couple of years, um, we've been looking closer at PBV as an option. Uh, we do like that there are no REAC inspections with PBV. Um, you know, REAC is one thing that we would not like to have to deal with if we don't have to. Um, we also like that we get the admin keys uh, on PBV. And then another thing that our agency has been considering is the possibility of applying for move to work. And so when it comes to the fungibility of being able to share dollars between programs, that's really only going to be an option if we control that administration with the PBV. So we've been looking at gradually transitioning over uh, to doing our RAD through that program. Okay, thank you for that. For the West Coast view, let, let me ask you, uh, I see quite a few of your transactions uh, are planned to be FHA insured. It does, has that influenced your decision at all or? Um, no, actually, um, we, I don't think we've been doing any FH insured. No, these are, these, well, your, your RAD applications had the box ticked for FHA insured on uh, eight of your, seven of your projects with oh. CHAPS, with active CHAPS. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with what we've been doing in that regard. I haven't been paying closer attention. Okay. All right, and and looks like many of your projects are tax credit uh, projects. Are well, your, all of them are tax credit, yes. All of them are, yeah. yes. So we've done a combination of using tax credits to pay for uh, rehab. We've also done demo of the site and then new construction on the same site. And we've also done transfer of assistance to completely newly constructed sites. So we've, but they've all been tax credit, the majority of them 9%. Uh, we're just now doing our first 4%, which is a RAD PBV Section 8 blend. Yeah, you have an amazing number of 9% allocations in California, which is so competitive. Like, I'd like to learn more about how you do that, but not on, not <laughs> on the conference here. <laughs> um, very good. So, um, Joseph, we'll go to the, we'll flip all the way over to the East Coast and tell us a little bit about uh, your, your transactions and uh, you're also um, making a change or considering change um, in, in your choice. So tell us, share with us your, your thoughts about that. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for having me. We are a large public housing authority. We have a, a large Section 8 program, including PPV program. So for the most part, we do lean toward PPV for all the reasons that you said in your presentation. I think that um, you know, philosophically, the, the Boston Housing Authority would like to keep these properties um, 
in our broader portfolio and some of the ones that the ones i'm talking about today in fact are mixed finance sites where um the bha doesn't own the property directly so i think our default um approach would be to go with ppv um certainly the admin fees that come with that are appealing and also we see the choice mobility aspects to be more appealing with the ppv uh, option but there are um there's at least one property that we have that we we knew right off the bat that p p r a p b r a made more sense um and and then there's a second one that i think we might we might be heading that way that that first property the sort of obvious one for us is a small property it's um 34 units of acc acc units i think about 50 units total it's a site that was an original mixed finance site and it was we funded some capital work there drawing on one of our hope six grants in the past but the property actually had never been a boston housing authority public housing site to begin with it was an off-site um aspect you know of, of a hope six program that we had and so we've always had some something of a you know arm's length relationship with that property um probably the most compelling reason to not try to go ppv with this particular rad uh, <clears throat> conversion is because this property has a, a very particular um, clientele that it's trying to serve of, of the 34 acc units 14 of them are set aside for individuals who are homeless or um, at risk of becoming homeless due to uh, persistent mental health conditions. Um, I have to be careful, I'm, I'm not an expert in how uh, waiting lists work, but I do know that we had to seek and we, we secured a, a waiver from HUD, from their Office of Fair Housing, um, in, in order to set up this particular uh, admission preference. And, you know, the, the reason for this is because we are um, partnered with a community development corporation that in turn has um, partners who are service providers who specialize in, uh, in serving this particular, uh, you know, population. And so for us, uh, it, it didn't make sense for us to, to try to bring this property into our PPV portfolio. Um, it, what was paramount was to, to be able to maintain the same waiting list uh, procedures and uh, that are in place right now. Okay, and then you have a, a very large project you're considering converting and, and that, that's influencing your thought about PBRA, yes? Yes, that's right. That's the second property that we have. And on this one, it is a large site. It's a mixed finance site uh, that was you know, over 20 years ago, a BHA public housing site. We have lost a little bit of connection with the, with the site over the last two decades because we do not own and manage it. Um, for us, I, I would have said, if you asked me you know, three months ago, I would have said this is a, a slam dunk PPV site for us but we just within the last uh, couple of weeks found out that this site which is large it's 445 acc units it got funded for four percent tax credits this year and we're realizing with sort of the, the quarantine and other things going on we're, we're under a bit of pressure um and we need to figure out you know what we thought would be a very smooth you know process to fold it into our ppv portfolio, we're not sh so sure anymore um, from a staffing point of view, from just the, the paperwork that's involved. And so there, there is a very good chance that we may um, end up have, asking the, the owner to go the PBRA route. Um, I think that the owner is more interested in PBRA because of some of the same reasons as the other site, that that ability to control the, the waiting list process is very appealing. Um, I, we're not so thrilled about the idea of giving up um, admin fees and, for that matter, having to potentially 
uh, you know, provide future mobile vouchers for choice mobility aspects. But um, I think we also are under a lot of pressure to close the deal this year for volume cap reasons. And so uh, it, it's an active conversation right now. Okay, well, thank, thank you for those uh, thoughts and insights. Uh, so Anthony, tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing with, with RAD. It looks like virtually everything in your portfolio is, is under a, a chap or is already closed. So tell us what your thoughts are. And I think you're doing a little of both PBV and PBRA as well. Yes, that is correct. Thank you for having us to participate today. Um, we have uh, converted roughly 60, probably close to 70% of our public housing already has been converted under RAD. You know, the, the remaining projects we have uh, include some mixed, fun includes a mixed finance project. And we are actually very happy because we are converting one of our oldest public housing projects. We're excited about the redevelopment plans for that. You know, so in, in that particular project, we, you know, we are using RAD section 18, the 7525 blend. Um, certainly all of that's going to be um, uh, 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 PBV because, you know, we want, certainly want to take uh, advantage of, of the tenant protection vouchers because we have to deal with relocation at that particular site. But then with a mixed finance project, as you indicated earlier, we're in an opportunity zone. And so certainly uh, we're doing the uh, PBVRA uh, and with that particular project. And that one was very unique from the standpoint that, you know, we actually uh, exercise our right of first refusal in that project. Um, and we bought out the GP and the limited partnership. Uh, that was quite an extensive exercise added some cost to the project. So, you know, the PBRA, you know, and then with the opportunity zone, it was really driven by the economics of, of that particular project where we saw that it was advantageous to us to go with the, the PBRA for that particular project. But the majority of, of our uh, portfolio is uh, using uh, PBV. So, uh, you know, and to, 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 uh, the points that everyone else has made um, with respect to, you know, the benefits of not having to deal with React and the admin fees, all of those were important, but probably of those two, I think uh, doing away with React would, would way outweigh <laughs> admin fees a, a little bit. Uh, so that's where we are, we are finding ourselves uh, with respect to our execution of our, our uh, plans going forward for the conversion. Okay, very good. So Grace or Christina, are there, are there some questions that we can share with our panel and see how they can help me answer the questions? <laughs> sure, so Christina um, has, has a couple questions. I don't know if they're specific to, our, to the panelists, but um, Christina, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Just hop over to the questions. Uh, so wh while you're reviewing those questions, I'm going to ask a question of the panel. Um, in terms of getting staff up to speed for the change from operating public housing to operating uh, either RAD PBV or RAD PBRA, how was that, exper uh, how was that experience for you and uh, what, what kind of preparation ahead of time did you have to, have to achieve? Anybody on the panel? Well, I can speak to our agency. It was a, a huge restructure that we actually did. Uh, we went from having district offices that managed multiple sites to going to more of a uh, site-based format. And so it, we went through about a year of, you know, working with HR and consultants and job descriptions. And uh, we just restructured everything to where it's now site-based. And because we were going to tax credits, it was also having a property manager live on site was a huge change. And so, you know, we had to get staff comfortable with that and, and had to send them to all kinds of trainings on, um, you know, different compliance that they weren't used to administering. Uh, but 
now that we're, you know, several years into it, you know, I think it's gone really well, but it was bumpy, bumpy in the beginning, trying to get everyone on board with making that big of a transition. Okay. You no, know, for, for, for us, uh, I mean, we had a downsizing of our organization because the individuals that were working, you know, at our public housing units, they switched over and went to work for our developer partners who actually ended up managing, you know, our sites, which were the towers and, you know, represented about 597 units out of our roughly, you know, almost 900 units. So that was a downsize for us. And we are continuing to make the shift as we go forward. But, you know, one of the things that we are doing also and looking forward to the future is that we, we know that we want at some particular point, the way we are structuring our transactions, um, you know, once we get through that stabilization period and, and uh, meet certain uh, uh, milestones uh, under the 4% tax credits, you know, we have provisions within our transactions where we are going to step back in and take over the management. So although we moved away from the management uh, currently, we are having to also plan for rebuilding our entire management team at some point to be prepared for the future so that we can move back into that role. Okay, thank you. So Christ Christina, what do you got for us? Uh, so, this first question, um, I'm going to throw it out there to see if, if you'd like to tackle it now. Otherwise, I think we can respond in written form. It's a PBV rent cap question. It says, our public housing development had flat rents of $1,014 established in 2014. The FMR in 2014 was $1,087. Why are our RAD PBV rents, um, they were issued at $697 contract rent with $141 utility allowance? Yeah, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't follow that. So let's take that one off, offline. Will do. Yeah. Next question is um, explaining choice mobility. Okay. Anybody on, on our panel want to explain choice mobility? It's not really a well, PBV or PBRA. Are they asking, you know, what, what are the differences under PBV and PBRA? Let's, let's address that question because that's, that's related to the panel topic. So the, 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 the fundamental, there's two fundamental differences the RAD PBRA, uh, as was mentioned by one of the panelists, kicks in after two years. Um, and so the panelists mentioned that that gave them an extra uh, year to, to uh, get everything, you know, all the kinks ironed out and, and have the residents be satisfied and, uh, and not wanting to uh, leave the prop property. So uh, that's one change. The other change is that under under PBRA, it's, uh, there's, there's a little more ability to restrict the percentage of turnover in your uh, voucher program that has to be used to satisfy uh, choice mobility requests. So those are the two uh, broad brush uh, differences. Uh, Joe or Christine or Anthony, any additions to that? Just my only comments were, yeah, if you're not familiar with choice mobility at all, it basically, it gives that tenant that just has a project-based voucher the right to kind of take that voucher and make it mobile after 12 or 24 months, depending on which program you go. And so that was one of our concerns was you, you have to still leave the, the site project-based, but then they also get a voucher. So we were concerned that that might impact our availability of regular vouchers. Uh, what if there's a, a huge outflux of families wanting to move? Uh, but it ended up being a lot less than we were worried about. It was it ended up, like it's it's not an easy process to manage, but we didn't have as many requests for it as we thought we would. And how about how about the, the other authorities on, on our panel? Yeah. Boston. I would say that um, we, we have a concern with 
regarding PBRA in that it's my understanding that um, our housing authority would need to pledge the mobile vouchers in, in that case where the, you know, in, the, in our case, it's a mixed finance owner who is entering into a contract with HUD. We, we would nevertheless be responsible for, for providing mobile vouchers at, at any point in the future when a, a resident wants to take advantage of the mobile voucher option. And, um, you know, that's, a, that, that's an obligation that, that is added to, to the housing authority. And in, in a way, it's, it's one that's not really compensated if, if we're not getting um, administrative fees and that, that sort of thing. Well, at, at that Our point, projects, I, we, are, we are coming up with that uh, first year anniversary, so we'll know uh, what that impact will be upon our program. And so I'll get back with you to let you know if, if I'm, I'm still supported of it or not. All right. And I will point out that uh, Robert in his, his presentation indicated in, in the lookup of information on the resource desk, at the outset of the program, there was a great deal of angst about choice mobility. And I, I think our, our experience, my experience has been, and, and everything I understand from, from my colleagues and, and folks at HUD, is that it, it, hasn't, uh, it hasn't been the concern that a lot of people thought it, it might be. So uh, it seems to have, have uh, quieted down as, as an issue. Okay. Christina, you have anything else for us? I do. Um, with these transitions, have you seen a downsize in your workforce? If so, by how much? Anybody want to tackle that, Christina? I can say for us, uh, we have not had a downsize. Um, I think we've actually picked up on the amount of staff that we have since we started doing conversions, uh, just because um, it's, it's not easy to um, you know, have site-based staff at every site and still maintain the same number of staff that we had before. So that we have some flexibility where if it's a smaller site, we can share staff and they may spend 50% at one location and 50% at another location. But overall, we've had an increase because we, we manage all of the properties ourselves. Okay. Anybody else, Anthony or Joe? We, we probably had about a 15% uh, downsizing of our staff because we lost all of our management staff and maintenance staff that we had at those uh, three at our public housing sites. You you lost them. They were they were picked up by by whom or they were picked up by our developer partners by the management company of our of our development partners. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, we didn't lose those individuals. Kept their jobs. They had an opportunity to to transfer to the new management company. Right. Yeah, and for us in Boston, we have not had any changes, but the RAD transactions that we've closed to date have all been with, um, you know, with fairly small properties. And the, the ones that we have on the horizon, I, I think that is a concern for us. We have a little bit of experience, as so, sort of to speak to one of the earlier questions, we have a little bit of experience with properties that converted from public housing to section eight um, several years ago. And it was, you know, it, it was, it was a tough conversion. There was a real learning curve and, but we're trying to be very mindful of that so that we can bring our existing staff up to speed and the differences in the program so that as we do do future conversions, we won't, um, you know, we, we won't find ourselves in, in a staffing um, jam in any way. Okay, so in our, in our remaining minutes here, I'd like to give each panelist a minute to give their advice to our audience who are primarily uh, uh, authorities that are new to RAT. So they haven't gone through the transition that you all are going through. So um, I'll start with Christina and then Joe and then Anthony. So um, I guess my advice would be, um, you know, 
take it a little bit at a time. Uh, make sure that you've evaluated all of your options. We've done a little bit of both. Um, if I had one to recommend, um, I think I do still like PBRA, even though we have to deal with REAC, <laughs> um, just because some of those options that we discussed earlier on the, um, the choice mobility and consistent funding stream and that our staff feel like they're better able to manage it in house rather than having another entity or another department, you know, do the recertifications and fill the vacancies for them. So that one overall our management seems to like that program. Okay. Joseph. Yeah, sure. You know, I hope I'm not going off script too much, but I, I will say one of the overarching lessons that we've learned in Boston is that um, for us, the, the ability to do a, a, RAD PP, a RAD Section 18 blend approach has really been key because our fair market rents are so far high, higher, you know, above the, the RAD rents that it has really made the difference between feasibility and infeasibility. So I, I advise folks to, to look closely at that option. It's, it's a really great flexibility that's been introduced in the past couple of years. Right. And your, in your case, your, your uh, FMRs are like 30 to 40% higher than your RAD rents. So yes, definitely. Good. And Anthony, your words of wisdom? Well, I will say to everyone, do not become uh, uh, frightened by the process. Um, it is uh, it's, it's quite an involved process, but there are a lot of resources there to assist you uh, along the way. And uh, we have made it through the process by having very strong developer partners that work along with us at uh, every step of the way from the, from the inception of the project to through the construction and, and for the management side. So we've benefited from those partnerships. Um, so, you know, I, and, and certainly the, the technical assistance from the RAD Resource Desk and the other individuals have been e extremely helpful to us to get through the process. You know, I, if there was one bit of advice I would give to anyone, it's uh, certainly the advice I got when I attended one of the conferences. Don't follow the model of, uh, of uh, Little Rock Housing Authority where we have done multiple projects in one transaction. You know, we've done three or four different projects in one. I would say take them one at a time, do it incrementally. Um, you know, having three or four projects, which we have not learned, we're continuing to follow that, that model <laughs> to get them done <laughs> because of economies of scale and everything else. Um, you know, take it a little bite at a time because it is a, a large elephant to get through this process. All right. Well. I think we're at the end of our time, but I, I thank all three of you uh, from, from Boston, Fresno, and the middle of the country, Little Rock. So thank you for your contributions to our audience here. And Wonderful. Christine, I'll throw it back to you. Or does it go back yeah, to Yeah, we're going to, we've gotten a lot of questions and we're going to um, work through them, but we're, I think we're going to have to provide some written responses, which is great. Thank you guys for contributing. Um, so the panel, really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Jaime. Um, we are going to now <laughs> transition over to a, a presentation by Greg Byrne um, from the HUD Office of Recapitalization about requesting um, technical assistance. So Greg, are you ready to go? Let's see. He needs to be system. unmuted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, Grace, do I need to, are you going to put my video on or do I need to hit start video? Here we go. Just asked you to start your video. And Greg, I think you should give uh, Fresno uh, the, the Greg Byrne uh, kudos for, for site-based management. And yeah, <laughs> they embraced it. They did. Okay. okay, Greg. Um, there you go. Looks like your video is coming so, through. I'm gonna put a. I'm gonna put a uh, PowerPoint up in just a minute. Yes, um, wonderful. I uh, just. Um, uh, I can't help. Even though this this particular topic is on TA, I can't help but sticking my nose in uh, just a couple of final comments on the very important topic that Jaime just uh, cheered 
or chaired. And um, so on this issue of staffing, I just want to make a point that there's nothing in the PBV or PBRA program that causes anybody to, I know people are always concerned about um, how will a program affect my staffing and does RAD somehow reduce staffing. RAF, RAD doesn't do anything that causes you to reduce your staff. Um, and you uh, heard the sort of experience of Fresno about some of the impacts on staff, in that case, increased staffing. It's usually more external forces. So in the case of, you know, what is in that case, the state HFA, when you get uh, tax credits, they have certain requirements in that state of California where you have to have on-site management. And so that, that, in that sense, it went beyond anything that HUD would require. But that was just a function of a PHA doing tax credits, whether it was inside a RAD or, or not. Uh, or if you choose to do, uh, to do something where you're going to require to bring your developer in because you don't have the capacity to pull off the deal yourself, um, that developer is going to have some say over uh, how the management is done, uh, depending on sort of what your bargain or deal is with the developer. Uh, so it's not RAD per se, but it's, again, other things that sort of are dictated from the outside. Um, I also saw, I think, a question coming in, which I think is an important one, so it's worth taking a minute on about new voucher agencies. So HUD has about 2,400 housing authorities nationwide that operate a voucher program, and um, uh, but HUD is not creating new voucher agencies. So uh, if you're a PHA that wants to convert to PVV and you don't have a voucher program, you can do that. You can convert. Uh, you'll just need to find a voucher agency. There's usually uh, always someone willing to step up, except in some rural, uh, very remote markets. But, um, but generally, there's a there's a, some other PHA would be happy for the business. Uh, but just HUD has, and again, this is not a RAD program. This is just a general PIH issue, which is uh, they're not in the business right now of creating new new voucher agencies. Um, anyway, I could talk more, but that, that was great. Thanks for that panel. Um, a lot of good sharing there. So uh, this first day was intended to be um, very much sort of a warm up. You know, it's for, sort of, I think even in our materials, we said we, we expect this more to be sort of more newer awardees who may, who may chime in on the first day because for those who've been around for a while, you've already you're already experienced in the resource desk and you're already, you've already had to make the decision about PBV or PBRA. So the thought was these three uh, topics today were really things that sort of more or less for newer agencies, um, uh, things that you had to make decisions out uh, on out the gate. You know, you had to get to know the resource desk and you had to make a decision because it drove it drives so much whether you're going to do PBV or PBRA. Um, uh, this topic now uh, is actually is a little more universal, um, but the question is, uh, what type of technical assistance does the Office of Recapitalization uh, offer to awardees? So, uh, and we've changed this about six or eight months ago, so we're going to walk through it. But to do that, I got to share the screen, and uh, when I do that, uh, I always uh, get goosebumps because I'm not. <laughs> You're doing great. Software. So let's see. All right, so you there should go. one of you a PowerPoint that says requesting technical assistance, uh, and it even has my name on it. So isn't that great? Uh, okay, so um, uh, so who, 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 why or where do we offer technical assistance? And so um, they uh, we created this. I'm not sure if the word actually exists in any of our literature, but at least we refer to it as the launch period. So these days. We used to have a, to have a, a program where we used to, uh, awardees would get, you know, you get a CHAP and then there'd be very specific milestones, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days that you had to do certain things and get your PIC application, removal application in, get your annual plan done, hire your, your third party physical needs assessor. And over time, we've sort of moved away from those prescriptive, you know, uh, specific milestones and have said uh, basically, hey, here's your award. You've got X amount of time to pull this deal off. And uh, we don't care about the interim stuff. Uh, we want to make you aware that you better get some things done because you may never get to uh, meeting the milestones. Um, but so we no longer 
really sort of um, uh, impose or or haggle you about um, about interim milestones. Um, and, and moreover, uh, more in the most recent RAD notice, uh, we used to be prior to the, the RAD note, the recent RAD notice, we used to have different milestone dates depending on um, the um, type of transaction, whether it was a debt or no debt or a tax credit. And these days, uh, we don't do that. Everyone sort of starts off with 270 days. And I think Alan and Seema in their presentation tomorrow or the next day, we'll talk more about that. But, but to say everybody, when you come in, the first time you come in, um, we assign from our technical assistance team a uh, technical assistance provider. And uh, that's for four months. And the, the goal of that is to really get you on board. And get you on board is introduce you to the resource desk, um, uh, uh, make sure that your original conceptualization of what your plan is for the property makes sense, um, uh, review your milestones, and just go over the basic RAD rules. And, and the idea would be there'd first be a call with you in the field office, sort of an initial kickoff call, and then more or less a call every month for the next three or four months, more frequently if necessary, to just see how you're doing, uh, uh, impart sort of more information, uh, don't, don't sort of overwhelm you in the first call, uh, but that by the end of four, period, four months, that the hope would be you're more or less you've graduated, right? that you're, you're no longer a newbie, um, uh, you've gotten more um, uh, experience and, and comfort level with the RAD program, and that we, we then wouldn't hold your hand there after that. And we would say, you've graduated, and uh, now if you need some help, then ask for some. Um, uh, we can't just presume you need help, and then we're not going to stick around for every month and have calls with you. But if you need some help, we're here for you and just let us know what help you need. And it might be immediately after the launch period, um, or it could be several months go by when you're feeling really good and then your physical condition assessment comes back and it just blows your budget up. And, and you're like, what am I gonna do now? I thought I was gonna do a debt only transaction and now I gotta go find some financing. I wasn't planning on finding financing. I need a little help. I need a little help either thinking about how I can uh, massage the physical condition assessment and see ways in which you know uh, 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 I, I can manage sort of how to get those needs done, or or I've never done a pro forma before. How, how do I go out and get a loan? So so the notion is after four months, uh, your, any initial awardee, if you need some help, then come in. So what are the what are the things that we offer technical assistance on? But again include but not limited to you know discussing what you're trying to do with your property again particularly if if once the physical condition assessment comes back you realize oh my gosh this isn't the deal that i thought i had i thought my property was in great shape i didn't realize there was mold and i didn't realize there was some underground utility work that had to get done and and, and i just don't have the resources and capital fund or reserves to pay for that um, if you're having, if you're struggling going through the third party reports like the CNA e tool or the environmental tool, um, find, struggling with how to finance the conversion, um, uh, not understanding what the submission requirements are, you're, you're, you want to do a transfer of assistance and it's not clear to you sort of um, what standards you have to meet. Um, uh, RAD resource desk, website navigation, uh, you know figuring out who you need to pull together for your team and just overall uh, uh, project feasibility. So, so the difference between that technical assistance, but we also have this just general help desk, the RAD resource desk, the help desk, and, and sort of what's the difference between the two? And, and the di difference is it's sort of more technical, which is ask the help desk, you know, it's sort of trying to say, where do I find that submit button on the financing plan page? I'm ready to submit, but I'm looking for it and it's not showing up and there's something wrong with my resource desk right now. I need someone to, to help me do it. Or uh, I loaded a file in the wrong place on the resource desk 
And can someone please tell me where I'm supposed to put this darn file? Uh, that, that's a resource desk or a help desk thing. Um, but technical assistance uh, is uh, uh, something like, um, I'm trying to figure, the, to decide whether how much I should put into the annual deposit to replace reserve versus the initial deposit. And I'm trying to say, why would I put a little here versus here? And, and what impact might that have on my pro forma? Um, uh, that would be a great uh, uh, question for, for or area for technical assistance. Okay, so um, in this, hold on a sec. Uh, here we've just given a couple examples of uh, PHAs that have asked for technical assistance. So, so we'll just read this. So PHA says single family homes recently conceived, received a capital needs assessment. Uh, the projection shows ending balances becoming lower than the floor after 10 years. Uh, we'd like to increase the annual deposit, but we want to uh, want to understand how it would show recapitalization around year 70 in case it chooses to finance the work in later years through tax credits? That's a great question, right? So the PHA is saying, listen, I think I can make this deal work more or less uh, probably without uh, going after tax credits now, but maybe in seven or eight years, I'd like to. What, what box or what constraints am I under? And how will the RAD program allow me to refinance in seven or eight years? I wanna make sure I don't sort of tie my hand. So, so that's a great example. Um, one, uh, I would like to have a technical assistance call with the RAD desk to discuss the effects of FHA shared risk on RAD projects. Uh, what changes in the RAD process will be required by this and discuss what is needed for a concept call. So this is a great question because um, uh, uh, there's so little actual expertise in the world on FHA risk share. It's a hard program to find uh, people who really know a lot about it. Um, and this is one when it came in, we had to sort of say, okay, who, so who knows risk share? Uh, 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 and, um, uh, and so we found somebody that, that knew it and were able to help the PHA understand whether sort of that was the right type of financing vehicle to use uh, to help with their conversion. Uh, another example, uh, requesting assistance to explore repositioning strategies for scattered sites in an effort to maximize cash flow. Uh, the physical needs assessment as a whole will require extensive financing, therefore reducing cash flow. Okay, great. So they get a site property uh, that uh, they're trying to uh, reposition through RAD, and uh, what's the best way for them to do that? But by the way, uh, beyond just the, the financing of, you know, what's the sources of funds for scattered sites, scattered sites really are one of the biggest challenges for PHAs, whether in RAD or through Section 18, about how do you make those deals work and how do you do it economically and how do you, how do, you do a physical needs assessment across multiple uh, sites and, uh, and, and how does the assessor also uh, handle the, um, uh, the environmental review for scattered sites. Those, those are tricky, challenging um, uh, things. And to the extent that we've learned something from others who've now sort of bend down that road, uh, uh, we're happy to share it with PHAs who uh, uh, you know, want some technical assistance. Okay, so um, those are just some examples of uh, how a PHA or what PHAs ask for with technical assistance. And uh, so how do I do it, right? And you know this, uh, and it's pretty simple, uh, which is you're gonna submit it through the RAD resource desk. Um, and ultimately, um, my, my job is I oversee all the transactions. And so ultimately someone asks for it and then it comes through my desk and I look at it electronically and we say, okay, is that a reasonable request? And uh, assuming it is, then uh, uh, enterprise community partners who's helping us organize, of course, this whole conference today, but there are technical assistance sort of arm um, then we assign a, 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 like a task order or a job order to enterprise and, um, and they'll then find someone from their team and they've got a pretty deep team of, of technical assistance uh, providers uh, uh, to draw from. And uh, all we ask is that you just have, you only have one open TA request at any time 
Um, and, um, but once you're finished with that, if you have some other technical assistance requests, come back and submit us a new one. Um, and that generally each one of these, these are sort of uh, 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 time limited, sort of short order things. We sort of say, okay, we'll generally give you up to 16 hours per request. And if you need some more, then, then come back to us. If you ended up, did you, you were able to solve it in less than 16 hours, perfect. Uh, and if it turns out that the job requires more than 16 hours, then the uh, TA provider will um, uh, report back to us and say, hey, uh, we, we need to go deeper on this. Uh, uh, Greg, can you make available some more resources for this? And we talk it through and we make it on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis in terms of the decision. Okay, so uh, if that's sort of generally how you do it. The nice part is you do it electronically. And, uh, and so as Robert showed you earlier today, the resource desk, uh, you see that, that uh, section of the resource desk where it shows uh, action items and you go to the action items and there's uh, two sort of, uh, uh, or, or uh, four uh, drop, drop down menu and one of the items there is request technical assistance. So bingo, I click on that. And then uh, we ask you, once you click on that, can you tell us the category that you're doing? Uh, you know, we've, we've created some general categories and this just helps us to monitor and track things. So is it portfolio engineering? Is it, is it, is it financing the conversion? Is it navigating the RAD requirements? So if you'll click on one of those or if it doesn't fit, then do other. And then you write in your description. You know, usually not more than a paragraph is necessary, but tell, it as, tell us what you want. And, and then submit it, um, I hit the request, and then it will come to us and we'll look at it and we'll get this. We, we're pretty good about turning this stuff around. Um, and, uh, and then, and then uh, you'll get someone from, from enterprise to, um, uh, to work with you to sort of resolve whatever that need is. So, so I'm gonna stop sharing you're good. that. You're, yeah, you're good, wonderful, thank you. So, so um, uh, uh, so that's it. So we really do encourage people, though, to to uh, if you have technical assistance, you know, it's actually been undersubscribed, and uh, mm -hmm. we we were surprised by that. So don't be shy. Um, if you're a PHA or an awardee and you need some help and you're struggling with something, then um, send us a request, and we'll see what we can do to, to help it. We we really do. Uh, try to uh, help people have, you know, with successful outcomes. So that's really, we, we want you to succeed. We want you to, to, to close. And if we can do, if we can uh, uh, do anything to help you, uh, then, then um, that's what this is available. So Grace, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Wonderful, thank you, Greg. Uh, and we are right on time. So again, a big uh, thank you to all, uh, we had over 300 people on the webinar today. We really appreciate not only your participation, um, giving us feedback about kind of the technical sides of things. Um, as we said at the top, today is day one of five. So we will be in um, you know, email communication with you uh, consistently in your inbox over these next five days. Well, now just four more, four more days. Um, and just two logistical notes to leave you with here today. Um, Zoom has a feature where it'll pop up a, little, a quick survey at the end um, when you leave today's meeting. Please fill that out and let us know how you enjoyed the session today and if there's any constructive feedback you'd like us to know. And secondly, our coffee breaks um, are ready to get started. So if you have received a email confirmation from Michaela Miller, um, that means you have a, a coffee break scheduled today. If you have not, um, you can email her and we will include that in our email um, and we will match you with a, a, a RAD expert that you can chat with one-on-one -on -one about your questions that you may have. Um, our goal was to try to facilitate some one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, think of this as catching someone in the hallway or just at, after, after they get off the elevator um, in, the, in the hotel. So um, without further ado, I would like to uh, direct your attention to the chat box. Um, in that, you can click on the link to the Zoom meeting, and that is what is going to bring you out of this webinar feature and into the Coffee Break 
where you will be greeted by uh, Michaela Miller, who will be matching those of you who have appointments with your HUD um, representative, and you'll be heading into breakout rooms to have a um, quick 15 minute chat. So again, a big thank you to everyone, and we will see you back here tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, and check your inbox again for um, the links for tomorrow's sessions, and we really appreciate uh, everything and your attention today. Thank you so much.